Okay, kia ora everyone uh, and thank you for joining us tonight for our digital event. I'm Juliet and I'm one of the marketing and engagement coordinators at the Neurological Foundation. Uh, I'm so glad that you could join us this evening to hear from Dr. Victor Derex on Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy and a touch of COVID. Um, before we get into the presentation, I'd just like to run through a few housekeeping slides with you all for anyone who hasn't joined us before or for anyone who has, just a reminder. Um, so after that's done, we will, I'll hand over to Victor and we will move into the presentation. So just go share my screen. Okay, so yes, welcome to our event. Um, I just wanted to open this event with a whakatoki, which is a Māori proverb, um, which they typically use for inspiration. And this one in particular is on our head of research's office wall. So it's above her desk um, and it goes, E hara, takatoa, ite toa, takitahi, ingare, he toa, and that translates to my strength is not as an individual, but as a collective. Uh, and I just asked if um, Sarah, our head of research, could just share what that means to her. And um, she said that everything we do at the foundation is such collective effort and the council and committees that guide us and the foundation's decisions are all volunteers. We couldn't do anything without our amazing supporters who so generously donate to research, our clinicians and scientists that are able to carry out the research and the hospitals and universities that host the research. So the strength of the Neurological Foundation is a result of this huge collective effort. So we thank you all for joining us. And as you can see, your camera and your microphone have all been automatically turned off, so we can't see or hear you. Um, to communicate with us, you can use the chat or Q&A functions. Um, the chat button, in, they're both at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can use the chat button, just click on it. It will open up a pop-up window um, and you can use that to communicate with myself and Victor, um, if you need any technical support questions. Uh, for the end of the session, when we move into the Q&A, um, you can use the Q&A function, which will also bring up a uh, pop-up window. Um, you can type your question in down the bottom. All of the questions will be visible by all the attendees here, and we will be able to see who has submitted the question. If you would like to remain anonymous, you can just tick the little box in your question uh, that says to send anonymously. Once it's submitted, um, we will have the option to either answer it live or you may get a typed reply. It really just depends on, on how we go, but we will do our best to answer all of the questions that come through, but we do sometimes have the time restrictions. So um, apologies if we don't get to your question. Uh, and do please keep all of your questions related to the topic that is being discussed. And of course, our speaker will not be able to answer any personal medical questions that you might have. Um, but if you do want to know anything more about Parkinson's disease, which Victor will be talking a bit about today, um, you can always visit Parkinson's New Zealand and their website where they can give you support of, for people living with Parkinson's or family members. Uh, and at the conclusion of the session, the Zoom will end for everyone, and then the video will be available at a later date on our website. Okay, so a little bit about our speaker today, Dr. Victor Derix. Um, he obtained a PhD at the University of Ghent in Belgium in 2010. And then the following year, he moved to New Zealand and started working at the University of Auckland, where he established an innovative and transdisciplinary research stream on the early effects of Parkinson's disease. He is currently a Sir Charles Herkes Senior Research Fellow and Head of the Synuclean Lab at the Centre for Brain Research. And in 2020, he was awarded a Neurological Foundation Project Grant to investigate alpha synuclein strains in Parkinson's disease. So uh, that's all from me for now. I'll stop sharing and hand you over to Victor. Welcome, Victor. 
All right, nice to be here. I'll start my presentation. It doesn't matter how many times you do the Zoom, it, you always have to find the buttons in the at the time. So uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session. As Juliet said, I'm uh, a senior research fellow at the University of Auckland, and I uh, work on Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy. And today I'll show you a little bit of the things that we do in the lab and give you a bit of an explanation of of some of the difficult words that Juliet also mentioned in at the start. So I realized that uh, it might be a lot to take in. So, but if you want more information, uh, always feel free to uh, visit the website from my lab where there's a lot more uh, data and, and nice images. So let's get started. So, Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder of the central nervous system affecting the dopaminergic uh, cells of the substantia nigra. That's the classical definition of Parkinson's disease. So what does it actually mean? So it's progressive, so it, it's ongoing, and it degrades uh, certain parts of the brain, specifically uh, a neuronal cell type that is located in the substantia nigra. And when this happens, we, it results in these typical Parkinson symptoms, typical motor symptoms. And typically from uh, this disease is the presence of these uh, Lewy bodies. And you can see them here. They look a bit like donuts, uh, some round ones here and some Lewy neurites. So these Lewy bodies and neurites, they're full of this protein of alpha-synuclein. And a bit about that later. So, even though Parkinson's disease was first described over 200 years ago by James Parkinson, not a lot uh, has uh, realized in terms of therapy. So there's currently no therapies uh, that focus on the underlying um, disease mechanisms of Parkinson's disease. And that's what my research is about. So multiple system atrophy is quite similar to Parkinson's disease. And it's mostly misdiagnosed in the early stages as Parkinson's disease. So you'll see that the definition is uh, multiple system atrophy is a rare condition also affecting the uh, nervous system and also causing gradual da damage to the nerve cells. It results in motor symptoms and also regenital dysfunction and cardiac dysfunction. And we're seeing these uh, Lewy bodies and Lewy neurites as well. But one typical, uh, very distinct difference is that we see these uh, Lewy bodies occurring in a cell type called oligodendrocytes. And they, their function is primarily to insulate the neurons so that they can signal, uh, exchange signals a lot better. So the question is, where lies the difference in uh, Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy? But more on that later. So pathologically, Parkinson's disease is grouped with other uh, synucleopathies, uh, such as dementia with Lewy bodies and multi-system atrophy. And what keeps these uh, diseases together is that they're all characterized by the abnormal accumulation of alpha-synuclein aggregates. So the problem is uh, that all of these sub-diseases, they have uh, overlapping symptoms. So, and within these categories, each patient is affected differently. And it's not uncommon for a patient with Parkinson's disease to also have Alzheimer's disease, for instance. And each of these diseases is characterized by the accumulation of these protein aggregates that we call protein clumps. So in a lot of diseases, um, we have the accumulation of multiple uh, protein clumps. Uh, so it's uncommon to see a human brain older than 70 that is completely free of these protein aggregates. So a recent research uh, done in Alzheimer's disease found that in 38% uh, of the brains, we had about three different types of aggregates 
from three different proteins. And 12%, so 10%, about 12% of the people had four different types. So imagine that all of these protein uh, aggregates affect the brain differently. And when there's two, they affect it even differently. So when there's four, it becomes more and more complex. And there's a lot of other terms on the slide just to highlight the complexity that we have within Parkinson's disease. And that after all these years, this is still uh, a big question mark when it comes to Parkinson's disease. But we have just found some things out, so don't despair. So the current hypothesis is that Parkinson is caused by a complex interaction of genetics and the environment. So we know that exposure to metals, pesticides, and viral infections are all linked to Parkinson's disease. So uh, people working in mines have more chance of Parkinson's disease. We know that uh, wine farmers in France also have more chance of getting Parkinson's disease. And exposure to bacteria and uh, viruses is also being linked. So, and this is, leads us a bit to um, COVID. So in 2020, about five different case, cases were described of people that were perfectly healthy and two to five weeks after contracting, Parkins, uh, contracting COVID, they started showing typical motor symptoms uh, similar to Parkinson's disease. So upon treatment of uh, these symptoms with the typical drug that they use for Parkinson's disease, Aldopa or Cinemet, their symptoms subsided. So it's probably not likely that COVID started their Parkinson's disease. But what is likely is that COVID pushed um, their symptomatology over a threshold and allowed it for, uh, for the sudden occurrence to uh, come up. So up to now, and now we're gonna look a bit at the, what ha what's happening within the cell. Up to now, we've been looking at Parkinson's disease as one as the same disorder. But as I mentioned, it's actually a collection of sub-diseases with overlapping symptoms. But very uh, typical with all these diseases is that there is one thing in common, and it's the protein alpha-synuclein that forms uh, alpha-synuclein aggregates. So the formation of these aggregates is toxic for the cells. As the disease progresses, uh, um, these aggregates can move to neighboring cells. And over time, more aggregates are formed, more, cell, uh, more aggregates are spread, and it affects the entire brain. So this is well described in early research from, uh, from Brack. And he investigated over a thousand brains, and he found that most, in most of these brains, the earliest pathology that they can see is within the olfactory bulb. So people with Parkinson's disease have an impaired sense of smell in over 90% of the patients. And this happens five to 10 years before the onset of um, the typical motor symptoms. So, and that's why we see the alpha synuclein aggregates occur first in the olfactory bulb. And other region where we see it first is the brainstem. And this is probably linked to uh, the gut brain axis, which I won't go into detail, but we also see alpha synuclein aggregates being formed in the guts, and they can move up through the neural connections into the brainstem. So as the disease progresses and we go to later stages, first the neighboring regions are affected, and then the entire brain gets affected. So what happens in a normal aging brain? So we all age and our repair mechanisms uh, decline over time, which is a uh, normal uh, a progression of, as we age. And as I mentioned, it's uncommon to, see, to not see these protein aggregates in people over 80. But what is, uh, happens if somebody ages in a normal fashion is they do not reach this critical threshold of damage that is required for the first symptoms of Parkinson's disease to initiate. So let's see what happens if we put in an extra risk factor. Let's say a person has a specific mutation linked to Parkinson's disease. So when this person, uh, because of this mutation, the damage starts accumulating a little bit earlier, and this person 
reaches the critical thresholds and Parkinson's symptoms occur. The same thing can happen when we uh, are exposed not without having this uh, genetic mutation to these metals, pesticides, viral infections, all the environmental factors that I mentioned before. Again, the person reaches the critical thresholds and Parkinson's symptoms occurs. So when we combine both of these factors, both genetic and environmental risk factors, the onset of Parkinson's disease can occur a whole lot sooner. And this can go all the way into adolescence. One of my colleagues works together with a group of patients and one of these, pat these patients was diagnosed uh, in their early 20s with symptoms starting as young as the age of 12. So it can go really early. But don't despair and because not everything is lost. Because there's a huge impact of environmental factors, it means that we as a person, as a group, have a big impact on, uh, on this uh, diagram, on the time of onset. So we can actually delay uh, the onset by quite a lot. If we uh, do regular, regular exercise, caffeine has been linked to Parkinson's disease. This does not mean that we need to drink as much coffee as humanly possible. There is a fine uh, balance and it's about two to three cups a day. After that, it declines. And general healthy li living um, is linked to Parkinson's uh, reduced risk of Parkinson. One specific one is sleep. We know that during sleep, our brain clean, uh, clears protein aggregates from the brain. So it's important to have sufficient amount of sleep. So this is what happens in the brain of people with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, multiple system atrophy. So what is my aim? My aim is to get these protein aggregates and is to reduce the total amount of these protein aggregates. And by reducing these protein aggregates, either by degrading them or by uh, untangling them and reducing them back to their original shape, it produces how much the cell needs to cope with it. And it allows the cell to repair in itself, to be able to cope with the entire load. But it will also reduce how much is spread to the neighboring cells. And this is where, uh, where my uh, research is basically looking at. I'm not looking at a, um, to, um, yeah, I've, I've lost my words here. So my aim is to delay the onset of Parkinson's disease, not to cure it, uh, because it's such a complex disease and there's a lot of variability. And I'll explain my analogy a bit more. So in the 80s and 90s, when HIV was first discovered, it was a very deadly disease and you would die uh, um, within a few months, a few years of it. Now, 30 years later, HIV is a chronic disease. And by the use, through use of multi um, retroviral cocktails and a combination therapy, we can live a very long, healthy life. The same is true for Parkinson's disease. So I want to push out the onset of the worst symptoms of the actual, the motor symptoms, so people can live a healthy life for another one, five, 10 years. And that's my aim. So just to make it a bit more complex, we discovered recently that not all alpha synuclein aggregates are created equally. So depending on the original insult, where it be metals, where it be uh, pesticides, uh, genetic mutations, the cellular environment will change slightly. There'll be a different acidity within the cells. There might be a little bit of fever. And all these conditions create to the specific formation of unique 3D conformations of alpha synuclein aggregates that we call strains. Once a specific strain is formed, the structure doesn't change. And it functions as a template when, uh, to form more of the same alpha synuclein aggregates. So let me put this a bit easier. I've shown here two different strains, fibrils and ribbons. Think of these strains as different forms of pasta. We all know pasta, it's made out of the same ingredients, but you can have spaghetti, linguine, macaroni, fettuccine, and probably another 30 different types of pasta. And what is very typical is even though they have the same ingredients, their 3D structure is quite different. 
And your kids might like spaghetti or they hate spaghetti and they love macaroni, but it's actually the same thing. So the same thing is true for these strains. Even though they consist of alpha synuclein, their 3D structure is quite different. And when you look at it here with the fibrils, it resembles this spaghetti type. And when we add the fibrils to uh, rodents, met, uh, rats or mice, we see that we get a typical Parkinson phenotype. Whereas ribbons resemble more of a linguini type, which is flat with a bit of twist. Different things interact with the outside and it leads to a mixed pathology of Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy, with oligodendrocytes being specifically affected. So some of the research that we did is we looked at uh, the different cell types uh, of the human brain and specifically uh, counted how many cells had these alpha synuclein aggregates in them. So we looked at the neurons, um, which um, are responsible for the signal uh, signaling in the brain. We've got our oligodendrocytes, which insulate the neurons. We've got the astrocytes, which are star-like uh, cells, which have a lot of functions. The microglia are our immune cells of the brain. And then we have uh, the parasites, which are the underdog of um, the, the brain. So these cells are quite understudied, but have a very important function. They regulate the blood-brain barrier, so protecting our brain from outside influences. Um, they're very important in inflammation and signaling, and they are lost in part in Parkinson's disease. So what we did is we looked in the olfactory bulb specifically at which cells have these aggregates. And here you have a diagram, which I'm quite proud of. It took about two years to make with four different people, but it shows you that um, in Parkinson's disease, pretty much all of the cells are contain alpha synuclein aggregates, except for oligodendrocytes, which is logical because it's typical for uh, multiple system atrophy. But importantly, it was the first time to show that parasites also contain these um, alpha synuclein gets, but more about that later. So where lies the difference between Parkinson and multiple system atrophy? So the aggressive nature and unique pathology of multiple system atrophy is, has been a kind of a mystery, but this strain uh, hypothesis kind of unravels it a bit more with strain alpha synuclein strains similar to the fibril type being linked to Parkinson's disease, whereas uh, alpha synuclein strain the, of the ribbon type is linked to um, multiple system atrophy. And what is typical is, of course, the uh, that in multiple system atrophy, the oligodendrocytes are affected, which is not seen in Parkinson's disease. So the problem now lies in what understanding what leads to uh, this MSA specific um, alpha synuclein strain, the ribbons. And it's most likely linked to a whole range of factors. What we believe in our hypothesis is that MSA uh, can only initiate when multiple factors go wrong. So, and this kind of explains the rarity of the disease because multiple system is a lot, much rarer disease than Parkinson's disease. So what we believe is that um, oligodendrocytes by itself cannot drive the disease eh? because they need alpha synuclein that comes from the neurons. But if only the neurons have something going wrong, so the neurons on here on the, on the left, then, but nothing goes wrong with the oligodendrocytes, then we get Parkinson's disease. If both things go wrong, so multi-hit, we have multiple system atrophy. And since multiple things are going wrong, unfortunately, this leads to a faster progression and spread of the disease. And one of the ways that alpha synuclein spreads throughout the brain, which I've looked into, is this tunneling nanotubes. Tunneling nanotubes are basically connections between cells. And I've shown them here below. So two cells are contacting each other. And when they move away, they form these small connections that allow exchange of uh, material, including alpha synuclein. And here is a 
a little video showing the exchange of uh, alpha uh, of material between these parasites. So we have the formation of the tunneling nanotube and then the exchange of the material from one cell to the other. This is not an efficient process, at, at least not in the way I investigate it. But again, if we have a disease that like as Parkinson and multiple system atrophy, which might take 10 to 50 years to develop, even inefficient uh, systems uh, can lead to a lot of damage. So here um, we have a mixed cell culture. So what we've done here, we've taken a biopsy from a human brain and cultured all the cells in a petri dish. It contains neurons, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, parasites, and microglia. So we then added fluorescently tagged alpha synuclein to these cells. And you see that some of these cells are becoming really bright red. And these cells, I call them the uh, Christmas lights, are the microglia. And they're doing their job. They're basically eating foreign material and trying to degrade it in order to protect the neighboring cells, which are uh, primarily the neurons. Well, when we look into more detail, we see that on the left here, it's a microglia. It, it's full of uh, alpha synuclein agarics. Here displayed as green. And here we see a red cell, which is a neuron, and a lot less uh, green is seen within the cell. And there's just one little uh, small dot within this neuron. So not as much, but again, over time, this can accumulate a lot of damage. This is an example here of a parasite, and compared to the neuron, there's quite a bit more green alpha synuclein spots there. So it points to the importance that parasites uh, play. And this is where my research is based on, on the role that, Parkinson, uh, that parasites play in Parkinson's disease. And for this, I collaborate with a French uh, researcher um, who had supplies me with different types of alpha synuclein uh, strains. And my idea, my target is to modify uh, targets within the cell to increase uh, reduction of these uh, alpha synuclein aggregates. So why parasites? So we know from previous research uh, and collaborators uh, abroad that astrocytes and microglia, which are the other cell types in the brain, that they are involved in a combined effort to remove um, alpha synuclein aggregates from the brain and thereby protecting uh, the neurons. But over time, uh, the repair capacity of the brain and of these cells reduces. So parasites might also play an important role in uh, this removal. And that's what I'm trying to look into. So parasites have the advantage is that we can grow them from uh, brains that are donated to the Neurological Foundation Human Brain Bank. So we have, a, when a brain gets donated, we can process it, but we can also take parts of it and culture the cells, uh, and in most cases, it's just the parasites, from diseased brains. And it allows us to, um, over time, amass a collection of different parasites with specific characteristics. So we have uh, over 270 uh, lines in the Hugh Green Bank, and some will originate from people with Parkinson's disease, others had Alzheimer's disease, and we have uh, parasites from people that were uh, normal, that didn't have any uh, obvious signs of uh, disease. And it's important to compare. So here we have an example of uh, parasites that I've given the same alpha synuclein aggregates to. And you see that these parasites take up alpha synuclein really efficiently, especially when they're uh, just by themselves without the microglia. So parasites are really good at taking these uh, cell at uh, these aggregates up. So the next question was, can uh, these parasites also degrade uh, the alpha synuclein? And so for this, we use a technique called Western blotting. So in Western blots, we use a gel on which we load the alpha synuclein aggregates. <clears throat> and Think of this gel as walking through a forest. So at the start of your walk, you have some big trees and there's quite a bit of distance between the trees. So you can walk quite easily. 
as you continue the walk, there's more and more trees accumulating. So it gets a bit harder to walk through. And as we continue, there's more and more bush. So it means that the bigger you are, the harder it is for you to go through this forest. Whereas your kids, the smaller proteins, can go through it quite easily. And the same thing is true for Western blotting. It allows us to separate our proteins based on size. So the smaller ones go uh, faster, so they uh, are found below, whereas the bigger ones take longer and we see them uh, above. So here we see that when I add alpha-synuclein aggregates <clears throat> to the parasites, this is what I give them originally. After about four hours, we see the original band, which means that some of the original alpha-synuclein is still there. And we see some shorter, uh, some smaller bands, which indicates that the parasites can cleave, can cut uh, the alpha-synuclein in smaller pieces and can degrade it. And after 24 hours, we actually don't see any original alpha-synuclein left on the western blot. So this shows that parasites can break down alpha-synuclein. And it doesn't really matter if it's a fibril or a ribbon, which is quite good. So what we do did next is we use the technique called RNA sequencing on different um, parasite lines, so three uh, healthy lines from healthy donors, and we compare them to three uh, uh, Parkinson lines. And we treated them with the five different strains that I have uh, at my disposal. But what is RNA-seq? Because it's a very di difficult technique. Think of RNA sequencing as walking into a library. So in the library, all the genetic information of our human body is printed in books. And you go into the library and there's books in the shelves and there's books open on the table. With RNA sequencing, we basically walk into the library and we take pictures of the open books. And these open books contain the recipes of the proteins that the cells are using at that specific moment in time. So we can use this in, in this setup. We can look, we go and walk in uh, without treating the cells and we can walk in after um, treating the cells with the different strains. And each time we take pictures, so each time we know what the cells are up to. And this is really important and has revolutionized uh, science because it allows us to analyze thousands and thousands of genes at one single moment. So this allows, allowed us to see which genes are activated and which are deactivated. And it, for this is an example here for fibrils, the fibril strain. It shows that there's about 170 uh, different genes that are differently um, reacting with and without treating uh, with fibrils. And when we look at um, all the proteins, all the genes that are changed, this is just a subset, but there's a lot of uh, changes that we're seeing. But when we go down into detail and when we overlap all the changes that we see for each of these five different strains, what is very noticeable is that there's not a single gene that is activated or deactivated in a similar way for all five um, different strains. And there's quite a, uh, to my surprise, there was quite, there was not a lot of overlap between these different strains. So, and this reinforces the pasta analogy and that these different strains, even though they're just alpha synuclein, but in a different structure, they affect the cells in quite a unique uh, way. So here's a bit of an overview of what I've done. Uh, so we've treated the parasites with these uh, alpha-synuclein strains. We did RNA sequencing. We get our differences. But very important is the next step, and that is the validation. So I'm spending a lot of time on this validation. We've got, a, we've got about 600 uh, significant changes uh, to look through, and we've done about 100. And so it's important to see if the recipe that we photographed with the RNA sequencing, if that is actually being made and if it's actually doing something in the cells. So for this, we use uh, the parasites in a Petri dish. We treat them and we look to see if the protein of the recipe that we uh, identified is available, is present, yes or no. And what is even more important is the validation on, on human tissue. 
because I can only replicate certain aspects of the disease in the Petri dish. It's important to look at the complexity of the human brain. So what we do as well is we validate our hits on human brain tissue, Parkinson's disease, healthy controls, and also multiple system atrophy, or we're starting to do it. And an easy technique that we're using that has uh, helped us quite a lot is that we have um, tissue microarrays, which are slides. And on these slides, we have the tissue of about, we can have up to 60 different uh, brain samples on there, which allows us with one single glass slide to test the, uh, to validate on 60 different uh, brains, which is important because as I mentioned before, Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy are quite um, uh, overlapping diseases. So there's quite a bit of variability. So we wanna validate this on as many brains as possible. So here we have some examples of uh, some of the genes that are coming up and are being, have been validated. So it's quite exciting to move into uh, the next phase of, of the research. And this is by using different um, biotechnological techniques such as CRISPR, RNAi interference. I'm not gonna go into detail, but the aim is to use these techniques to modify the recipes to either make more of it or to make less of it. And this will allow us to either remove or degrade more of these protein aggregates or untangle these protein aggregates into the original functional protein, thereby reducing the amount of uh, ag aggregates that's available. So less template, less um, protein aggregates to spread to the neighboring cells. And if we reduce spread, if we reduce the overall exposure, the aim, this will result in a delayed onset of uh, symptoms and the disease. So but with this, I would like to finish um, my talk and I'd like to thank everyone that's uh, been involved in this research, my lab group and all the previous uh, lab members that I worked with in uh, Professor Curtis's lab and all the other people within the CBR, but of course also the donors uh, of the brains and the funding agencies as well. And as I mentioned, if you have any other questions that I can't explain uh, today, there's a lot of information on my website. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. That was wonderful and so um, interesting. So we will now open up for the Q&A. Um, so I will just, let me just take a look here. Okay. Um, so bear with me if there's any um, lingo that I get wrong. I'm sorry. It's all good. Okay, so first question is, what do you see the next steps in your path taking? When might it show up as something that may help those living with Parkinson's? So um, it's probably one of the, the more frustrating things of, of my research is I know that this going from the lab to the actual drug discovery and getting it into uh, as a medication in somebody's hands will take several years. Mm -hmm. But luckily, I'm not the only one uh, doing this. So in addition to um, my research, I also focus on um, trying to unravel some of the other aspects that I've uh, mentioned. Um, what is, how can we help people today? Uh, is it through exercise? Is it, what are, um, what is true that we see in the, in the literature? How much, how well is it validated? How can we help people today? Um, so, but yeah, the future is looking good, especially for um, certain aspects of the disease. As I've mentioned, uh, there's a huge variability of um, within Parkinson disease. And a lot of research now is being focused on specific mutations within Parkinson disease. So there's quite a bit of advancements there uh, because we can actually narrow down some of the variation and uh, some of the mechanisms um, that are playing a role. Mm. 
Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate the beginning of your answer. I think it also speaks to what I shared at the start of the talk about being a collective. And yes, it can take a lot of time sometimes to, to get to the point of a drug in someone's hand, but we are very lucky. There's many people working on many, many things. Uh, okay, next question is, what is the normal function of alpha synuclein, synuclein, and why is it there in the first place? So alpha synuclein is, um, is highly expressed in neurons and um, it's really important for a good, um, for neurons to be able to communicate with each other. So in order for the communication to occur, signals need to be um, able to be exchanged between uh, neurons and alpha synuclein allows for the uh, smooth exchange of it. And it is, it is quite interesting. So in Parkinson's disease, we see that alpha synuclein uh, aggregates. In Alzheimer's disease, we have beta amyloids and tau that aggregates. In motor neuron disease, we have TDP. Uh, 43 that aggregates. We've in all of these diseases, uh, we have a particular protein that seems to aggregate and cause damage in some way. And all of these have their normal function. Um, but for some reason in these diseases, that specific one starts to aggregate and then it kickstarts the whole uh, disease. Hmm, the whole process. Okay, thank you. Um... All right, there's one question here. Uh, since there are so many overlapping pathologies, if you target alpha synuclein, what happens to the other protein aggregates? Will they just take over? No, oh, good question. <laughs> um, so, um, so, potentially, but it won't go as fast as this, right? It's not that uh, it's as a, a bacteria that reproduces as a, as a really uh, fast rate. So this is a slow process. Um, so when we uh, reduce the total amount, we'll, re we'll remove part of um, the toxicity, part of the problem. And there is other aggregates that play a role, but it's not for all of them and we will um, reduce some of the issues with alpha synuclein specific, specific. So one of the um, things that I will see happening, if we um, solve Parkinson's disease and we are able to um, postpone people's uh, onset of Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease for the same matter by another 10 to 20 years, uh, we will potentially see the rise of a new disease coming up, uh, similar to what we see in the saw in the past, with when we uh, were able to treat a cardiovascular pr problems, people all of a sudden became a lot older, and we see this onset of cancer and uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So, uh, if I solve one problem, will another arise? Yes, but yeah. it will probably give you five to ten years more. And who wouldn't want to take uh, that option? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that was a great question. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I've got a question here for uh, about collaboration. Are there other groups working in similar areas in other countries overseas? That, do you collaborate with, with other researchers and groups? Yeah, yeah. So as I mentioned, I work closely with um, my uh, French collaborator. He's in Paris. And Recently, we started working with uh, a collaborator in Switzerland. So science is, is very much a international um, uh, affair, let's say. Mm -hmm. And my aim is also to work more closely with, with Sydney, uh, which have um, been working a lot on multiple system atrophy. Because at the moment, besides me, nobody else is uh, working on, on multiple system atrophy within and New Zealand. So it's important to uh, to work on that. Yeah, wow. Uh, and Sydney's a lot closer than Switzerland. And <laughs> uh, okay, uh, a question here. Uh, as, oops, as exercise reduces brain alpha-synuclein and increases plasma alpha-synuclein, 
Do you see this as an option to investigate, particularly with the possibility of calculating what ex exercise may be best slash give the best results in various times? Difficult question. Um, mm -hmm. So what exercise specifically? Uh, there is no prescribed uh, specific exercise. It basically any exercise uh, will help. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a bit of um, a chicken and the egg issue. So people, some people will say, I've exercised my entire life and I still contracted Parkinson's disease. Um, so they'll say, oh, it doesn't work. But, and we can actually measure these people because we know how much exercise they've done and they still get Parkinson's disease. But on the other hand, all the people that did have a healthy life, did exercise, that didn't get Parkinson, so they did something, and uh, they didn't get Parkinson's disease. Is that because they exercised or was it not? So mm -hmm. that's kind of our uh, dilemma. So yeah. the specific exercise, there's not anything specifically. Uh, uh, some of the numbers that we see is two to three days a week, 40, 30 to 40 minutes, two to three times a week, 40 minutes, as long as it gets your heart rate up. And in some cases, which has been shown really uh, well uh, for Alzheimer's disease is if you uh, walk and talk, that is probably one of the best ways um, to, to help your brain because you're doing the exercise and you're talking and the social aspect, uh, which is something that is uh, showing up more and more in, in the data. Okay, all right, hikes with friends. <laughs> Uh, we've got a question here about the human brain bank. Somebody just wanted to know, is there a need for more donations from those with Parkinson's and how are the brains used for the research? So um, there's always more needs for, uh, for human brains. So if you want more information, I would refer you to the uh, uh, human brain bank. So if you look that up on the internet, you'll come to their website and all the information is there. Um, but what is interesting is that we need a lot of, the actual need that we have at the moment is healthy uh, brains because people with a disease such as Parkinson or Alzheimer's disease, um, a lot of people are very involved uh, with uh, the disease, they do research, um, the family is involved as well. Uh, so they mostly find their way to the brain bank uh, through different channels. Parkinson, New Zealand is one of them. But people that are healthy don't have that same thing. And it's really important, as I mentioned, to be able to compare between disease and uh, the healthy controls because that's um, really important because of this variation between each and every one of us. Um, so that's really important as well. Mm, yes, absolutely. Uh, Okay, you mentioned loss of smell as a very early symptom in Parkinson's disease and due to the alpha-synuclein accumulation in the olfactory lobe. Uh, this person understands that hypagogic hallucinations or nasty nightmares are also an early sign. Is, do you know anything about the, that? And is there an alpha-synuclein marker for that? Yeah, so um, so alpha synuclein, uh, we see it in the olfactory bulb, and uh, some of the research that uh, I've been involved in is showing that um, as we have more of these alpha synuclein aggregates in the bulbs, the little the small uh, proportion of the olfactory bulb responsible for smelling um, disappear, and hence we lose our uh, sense of smell. So the alpha synuclein is linked very much to that. Um, the uh, hallucinations is also a very characteristic uh, feature. One of the other features that is very uh, typical is constipation in people with Parkinson's disease. And we also see uh, a lot of alpha synuclein aggregates within um, the gut, uh, within the appendix as well. So, um, what is kind of uh, clear from the disease is as it, as we see the alpha synuclein aggregates 
move throughout the body, throughout the brain, we see different symptoms occur. And as it affects different brain regions, we have different symptomatology and it keeps on going until we get to the uh, worst uh, symptoms, of course. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so you touched on this, but could you expand on the difference at the level of these abnormal proteins between quote unquote pure Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease associated with dementia? So uh, that is very, very, um, very good question. Um, sorry, somebody just walked into my office. Um, so that is something that we're actively uh, looking into now. Um, so what we believe is potentially happening is that within Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy body disease, uh, it affects different parts of the brain and it can be small changes and that is something that we're looking into uh, at the moment. And it might not just be the strains that are affecting it differently. As I mentioned, we have um, the cells that can um, cleave, uh, they can degrade this alpha synuclein. And we see that in human brains, not all the alpha synuclein is broken down entirely. So we, we're left with fragments and we're still not sure what these fragments are doing within the brain. And are these uh, appearing differently in different regions? So that is something that um, is potentially linked to how these different uh, sub-diseases come up. Okay, thank you. Okay, do you know approximately how many people in New Zealand are thought to have Parkinson's disease? There's not an exact number, but um, the estimates are somewhere around 11 to 12,000 people. Uh, that have uh, Parkinson's disease. There's ne actually never been a real count of this, which is, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's about uh, similar to what we see in other countries. Right. Uh, is there any research into sensory processing of neurons to prevent aggregates forming, i.e. bombarding olfactory neurons? Uh, so this, not that I know of, so mm -hmm. I know of sensory, uh, of, um, you can train your olfaction and if you, uh, lose some of your olfaction, you can actually train your, um, uh, your nose to, to smell it better. So there are programs that you can do to actually do that. But how it relates to alpha synuclein aggregates, I don't think anybody has looked into that, especially not in humans. Okay. I didn't know that you could train your, your olfactory senses. Yeah, people don't, don't realize, and they always think that um, rodents and dogs have a really good sense of smell, better than us. Uh, the reality is that humans have a really good sense of smell as well. Uh, but we've been bombarded with all the odors that we have, of course, now everybody wears perfume, so mm -hmm. we haven't really trained it. And what people tend to forget as well is the majority of the odors are on the bottom few um, 10 centimeters of the ground. And that's where a dog's nose is and rats their nose are. And our nose is about a meter and a half higher, of course. Yeah, interesting. Uh, you did kind of touch on um, the, the genetic side of, of the diseases, but is there any evidence that either, I think they're referring to Parkinson's or MSA, are hereditary? Yeah, so um, there's been quite a few um, genes that have been linked to uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, and some with multiple system atrophy, but the research isn't as advanced uh, there, especially also because it's a more, it's a rarer disease. Um, but what I, and there are of course families where you see uh, father, son, all having uh, Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. So there is that familial connection. What I do want to say is that even though somebody has a specific mutation that we know is linked to Parkinson's disease. It's not a certainty that you will then develop Parkinson's disease. 
uh, as I mentioned, it's it's the complex interaction, right? And it's not just the complex interaction between genetics and environments, but you have to take into account that there's not just one gene in our uh, our cells. There's about forty. Uh, there's over forty thousand genes, and they all interact with each other. So a mutation in one gene might be um, might cause harm, but it could be that another mutation in another gene actually negates that effect. So it's there is a familiar link, but mm. it's not a certainty if you have a specific mutation to get Parkinson's disease. Okay. All righty. Uh, so you mentioned a relationship between having Parkinson's and also Alzheimer's due to the proteins. And is that a strong correlation? between the two diseases? So as I mentioned, um, we, um, a lot, some people with Parkinson's disease also have Alzheimer's disease and vice versa. And uh, interestingly, when um, they did a study on just the brains, a pathologist was blinded to the original uh, analysis they would find a lot of uh, brains that they would describe as Parkinson's disease that was diagnosed during life as Alzheimer's disease. So both these aggregates are there and it kind of, the symptoms that arise kind of depends on which aggregate spreads faster than the other one and how they interact. So mm -hmm. again, it's a very um, complex interaction and it kind of differs for each person uh, differently. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, we're just about out of time. So one more question. Uh, have you or maybe anybody else thought about investigating the effect of music on Parkinson's and treatment? Do you know anything about that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, and so there is um, quite a bit of work that has been done on um, meditation and music uh, on the effect of, of uh, Parkinson's symptomatology. Like mm -hmm. I've uh, spoken to quite a few people that say that they do meditation every day and their symptoms didn't change for 10, 15 years. And um, so I was quite intrigued by that. And um, meditation and music they have a direct impact on our uh, brain waves, and they can actually uh, modify a bit of the brain waves that are disrupted in Parkinson's disease. Wow. So a lot of work is uh, being done on that, uh, not by me, but by other uh, research groups. Okay, wow, really interesting. All righty. Well, that is, we're out of time now. So once again, Victor, thank you so much for joining us and sharing this amazing work and really looking forward to hearing more about it in the future. And thanks to everybody who's joining us from home. Uh, please know that we will be sending out a wee uh, link with a survey after this event. So please do give us your feedback on what you thought. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, there will be a recording available on our website uh, in the next few days. So thanks again for joining us. And thanks again, Victor, and take care. You're welcome. Have a nice evening. You too. Bye.